Hi everyone, welcome to the e-learning and evaluation accents in healthcare presentation. As Fritz already mentioned, my name is Matt Yankars. I'm the IT and operations manager for the Sousa Institute. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone that is a part of Moodle. Thank you to the creators, the developers, the community, everyone that is involved in making Moodle what it is. Without you, we would not have been able to accomplish nearly as much as, as we have. We would have been encumbered by expensive licensing fees and proprietary code that we wouldn't have been able to adapt to what we need. So, thank you to Moodle. So, to give you a bit of brief summary of who we are and what we do, this will give you a little bit of context and background before I explain how we use Mo Moodle. As mentioned in the description of this talk, the increasing incidence of cancer and advances made to screen and treat the disease demand health professionals with a very specialized set of skills and knowledge. These health pro professionals require expert critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making skills to be able to provide quality cancer care for patients and their families. Universities right now turn out mostly generalists. They do not have the skills and knowledge necessary to provide the best care for cancer patients straight out of school. That's where we come in. We are fully not-for-profit, originally created in 2008, so we're only seven years old, created by the government of Ontario to support nurses that care for cancer patients and families. So far, we have provided educational support to thousands of nurses. We are dedicated to a high level of standards and excellence in healthcare. And always our end goal is to improve patient care. Recently, in 2013, we have expanded our support to not just nurses but other healthcare professionals and to learners outside of Ontario. We had uh, just two learners from New Zealand sign up for some of our courses the past week. We are a small group so far. We're just under 20 people as a whole and I am very lucky to lead the IT team. Basically, we run the platforms that the Sousa Institute runs on, including Moodle, and had the instructional design and multimedia development team that designs and develops the courses that we offer. In the last five years, we've educated a little bit over 6,000 nurses, created more than 30 courses, each 10 hours longer, longer. These are more or less university-style distance education courses, but really focused on the theory and and applicability of cancer care. Topics range from things like radiation therapy to administration of chemotherapy to psychosocial topics like patient teaching and education and managing grief and loss when people die. So what makes an adult healthcare professional and not a standard learner? These are nurses, they are doctors, physiotherapists, social workers, even spiritual care professionals like chaplains. They tend to be in their 30s to 50s and have lots of demands on their time. It is very difficult to get healthcare professionals committed to a set class time. You're not going to be able to get them to sit together in a classroom. And if they are sitting in a classroom, they need somebody else to take care of the patients while they're off the unit. So to meet this need, we are essentially almost 90% online. All of our courses have an asynchronous learning component and participation. Our learners are able to log in when they have half an hour here or an hour there in between taking care of patients or at Starbucks after their shift. Taking all this into account, we want to provide healthcare professionals the skin, skills and confidence to be able to provide the best patient care. One other thing we've noticed is even though they are self-directed and motivated and they know what they want, they still need some structure. In continuing education, you don't often get any structure. There's no degree for you to see as the end goal. So we created something like a degree. We created the, the D'Souza nurse designation. To achieve this designation, a person has to do our core curriculum, write a specialty certification exam with the Canadian Nursing Association, and complete a clinical fellowship, minimum of 75 hours, so they can actually apply these skills on the unit. Only once they complete all of these requirements can they actually call themselves a D'Souza nurse. Our director likes to say, we won't change healthcare practice with a single course, but with a pathway and promoting lifelong learning, we may be able to change the system. 
One other thing I should mention is the four domains of practice. We don't want a person that just knows how to treat a certain a set of um, disease or type of cancer. To achieve designation, they have to take a course from each of the four domains. They have to know how to talk to families, how to support somebody that is crying because their husband just died. They have to know how to lead the team and develop their professional practice. And they have to know how to teach and coach, how to teach patients how to take a medicine regimen. All in all, for a full-time working professional, it may take about three to five years to finish all these requirements. So with all of these constraints, what is our approach to e-learning? How do we get learners interested in our courses and are coming back? When we started out, we had a little bit of leeway and since we were just starting up, we could research the latest adult learning principles, adult learning theory, and develop the courses in a way that they can be clinically oriented and applicable for the busy clinician. This guy up on the screen has a name. We call him Think About Guy. We have to make sure to get them to think about what they are learning while going through the material. How do they apply it in their day-to-day -day job? So in addition to Think About Guy, we have a range of activities. I'll demo some of these in a little bit and engaging interactions and practice. And what do I mean by an interaction? Again, it's practice, it's somehow applying their learning, at least as much as can be done without practicing on an actual patient. So these are things such as case studies and knowledge checks. All of our courses include social interactions. We put in forced discussion forums, in some ways forced since it's an assignment to discuss something, to get feedback from peers, Many of our learners are specialists in their field. They may be the only oncology specialist in their city. With joining in a course with other specialists, they can actually talk to other people, get feedback on what are they doing and what are the best practices and connect and network. They can connect across the entire country to get perspective on things and know that they are not alone. And of course, assessment. When when the things you're teaching can potentially kill people, you, you have to be very careful that uh, when you say somebody knows something that you're actually sure that they know it. So a sample activity, I'll pull this up in just a minute, but this is essentially a way of combining, I believe, an 18-page PDF into something that's much more digestible. In this case, these are a variety of uh, chemotherapy drugs and their treatments and side effects. In this case, we used visual anchors to help the learning. Each chemotherapy drug is connected to the plant that was derived from. And developing something like this takes a combination of understanding of both the subject matter, but the fields of user interface design and user experience design, and of course, instructional design and learning itself. Discussion forums, as I mentioned before, are meaningful interactions. They're not just, you must post twice. You can't just reply to a person, I agree, or say, good post. These are actual thinking required discussions. Often these turn into um, case studies of situations that people have run into. Names changed, of course, but again, it's sharing, learning, being able to learn from what others have run into. In developing these activities, it's a fairly standard e-learning production process. Uh, I'd say instructional design is key here because they are the glue that glues the educator together with the multimedia developer that can create the interactive, interesting graphics. We have the educator write some content. At this point, it's essentially more or less like a textbook style. We storyboard it, produce it with the multimedia developers, and then often run a pilot to verify that what we are trying to achieve is actually being achieved. Our content keeps changing. There is no set textbook that isn't out of date within a year or two in the healthcare field. New treatments come out, new guidelines are set out by uh, government organizations, and we help work with them to translate those into activities that um, translate that learning and make it understandable. We do use Flash very heavily in our courses. Unfortunately, as though you may have heard, Flash is a little bit on its way out. 
there have been a lot of complaints about the security on it and the big problem of Flash not working on tablets, like I, the iPad. We've slowly been transitioning to HTML5 development, but the tools there aren't quite good yet. And for, for those of you thinking of, if you do develop in Flash and thinking of moving away from it, carefully consider the timeline and what your learners are using. We can't support the iPad with in HTML5 activities without not supporting Internet Explorer 8, which a lot of hospitals and a lot of corporate organizations still heavily use. Sort of, we have one foot in the past and one foot in the future, and we're trying to do that big leap forward to catch up. And talking of catching up, there's regular course updates. Again, because the evidence keeps changing, we're on a little bit of a treadmill. We have to keep up with changing the evidence, changing the academic references. We link to a lot of external resources in our courses, and almost every single time that we run a course, we find some broken links. It's just link rot. It's amazing how fast things change on the internet. The other piece is, of course, the user feedback from mandatory evaluations. We get a lot of feedback in our courses, and we do use it. And I'll talk about evaluations in a little bit. So now, let me actually try and pull up our e-learning Moodle install and see if I can show you some activities live. If the gods of the demo will cooperate with me. All right, there we go. So this is essentially the Moodle clean theme, customized a little bit just with our colors, shifted things around a little bit, the check marks on the left as opposed to on the right. And the course structure, we use a format called collapsed topics, which avoids the scroll of death when you have a lot of resources in your course. The majority of our content is, again, an e-learning module since there are no textbooks that have the current evidence guidelines. And there are pre and post evaluations that I'll go into in a little bit. So let's see if I can pull up an activity here. There we go. So I'll pull up the PDF of what this is taken from. We still provide the PDF since this, that's something that they need to take away. And as you can see, it's quite large with lots of red text and important little bits in it that cannot be forgotten. So we took that and we turned it into this flash-based activity. Splitting the drugs into their classes, and doing little bits of animation. And again, chunking out the information into digestible formats, so that when a person opens this, they don't know there's an 18-page PDF in there. They're not going to get scared, at least not right away. Information also specific to things like community nurses is hidden away as needed. Administration tips. And again, things like red flags, like fatal if given in a certain way. And these aren't all that complicated. They're essentially click to show mores, but it makes a real difference in getting people engaged since they have to lean forward and actually click something, move their mouse. They're not just passively reading. Another activity. This was uh, quite inspired. This is around personal protective equipment that they're supposed to put on when they're administering chemotherapy drugs to make sure that they don't get poisoned over time from these drugs. So it's a fairly dry topic, but if we dress the nurse, we found out why it's important to put on a gown and the specific recommendations around what kind of gown it is or a mask, when to use a mask. I'm just gonna skip through a few other ones just to give you an idea of the format of courses. 
This is another activity, a multi-step, nine-step uh, oral chemotherapy patient pathway, specifically for when patients are given oral chemotherapy pills to take at home. It steps through what the healthcare professional has to do, but again, it's made a little bit interactive. They have to click to find out more. And there's illustrations to help them put themselves in the situation where they're actually gonna be doing that. And if they need to jump back, they can easily jump back. In some cases, we have had to hire actual medical illustrators to illustrate some of these. Uh, this one's a work in progress, by the way, so don't mind the yellow text. Uh, where is it? Here we go. This is, again, another fairly complex topic around the monoamine, mono, yeah, I think it's monoamine hypothesis of depression. Essentially, when you don't get certain, um, what's the term? Certain types of neural receptors not going to the right place, I believe. Again, a way of illustrating very complex information that lets the learner better understand and better contextualize it. And the last activity that I'll show if I can find it. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Let me just see. Screen three and seventeen. Here we go. So things like airway obstruction, we need actual medical illustrators to draw the actual proper physiology. They say a picture says a thousand words. <laughs> to the presentation here. Oh, I forgot to mention the case studies. So we do both Moodle quizzes for actual formative assessment where they are marked and assessed. And then there's case studies interspersed throughout the content. So we provide a situation, in this case, a person that has a certain medical history and this is in line with the content. We give them some additional information, a fake clipboard of their assessment scores. And then we ask them to answer a few questions. And these are low stakes, not, uh, not actually recorded scores. This lets them practice, figure out what they are learning, figure out why they didn't answer correctly and go back and review. All right, now let's quickly talk about evaluation. I think I have about 10 minutes left. Okay, so evaluation. We have to be accountable to funders and learners. Is our program actually achieving its intended objectives? We are spending publicly funded money, so everything we do is very closely scrutinized. This gives us a tool to say, this is how you're spending your money, this is the effect you are having. One thing we do that's a bit unique, I believe, is doing an evaluation at the start. We establish a baseline confidence level and skill level for each learner before they begin the course, before they're allowed to teach any, before they're allowed to touch any content. Uh, we use uh, Moodle's completion tracking to lock everything until they fill out the baseline evaluation. And at the end, we don't give them their certificate or their grade until they finish the final evaluation. And again, in that final evaluation, we ask at the same confidence levels and we measure what difference did we actually make in their skills? What gaps still exist? What do they still need to learn? For our evaluations, we use the Moodle questionnaire plugin. And uh, thank you to Joseph Rizzo and Mike Churchward for building and maintaining this plugin. 
So you can see, in this case, it's a radiation therapy course. These are some of the confidence ratings that we ask, like their confidence in describing the principles of radiation therapy or listing the common treatment modalities. And then we take that and we run reports on it and compare. In this case, this is the uh, measuring cancer care quality improvement, specifically with our chemotherapy course. About 2,000 nurses have completed the course across Ontario. Uh, there's also an annual maintenance course that they have to repeat each year to make sure they are still up to par on the skills required for chemotherapy administration. And we took their confidence levels and ran them through an exam before the course and after the course. And you can see there's a marked improvement in their exam score. In this case, this is also a special case of blended learning. We try and do as much as we can online, but for certain things like uh, doing, giving an injection of chemotherapy, you can't really teach that online. You can teach this theory, you can teach the, what they should do, but then we actually have a distributed model of uh, 30 facilitators at various hospitals across the province to actually teach them the specific skills of hands-on skills and also to add whatever context is relevant to their organization. Since we're not attached to any one specific hospital, we rely on these facilitators from each organization to fill in the gaps of uh, what is specific to the organization. What do they specifically do that is unique to them? And these are just some other samples of the reports that we generate. These are pre and post confidence levels on assessment tools used. And here, ratings of our e-learning and tools. We explicitly asked them, were the instructions clear? How easy was it to navigate the course? How was our technical support? And finally, text comments. Um, when you get 100 feedback comments from uh, students, it's hard to parse all of it together. So with a research background, we have a research analyst that uses a program called Envivo to group these together. So for example, I should be able to zoom in. These are all the comments around content. We know that it was useful content, it was informative, thorough, et cetera. And we do the same thing for weaknesses and figure out what do we need to change about our courses. This is great for a single course. Now, unfortunately, the questionnaire plugin doesn't have an easy way to pull many evaluations from many courses. Uh, in the past, we've had to export a CSV from each single questionnaire in each single course and then try and combine them together in Excel, which was a nightmare since some courses in the past would have had slightly different questions, others in the future would have more or less evaluations. Um, there is a data tools from essentially used in the big data field. I use the tool called Pentaho. It's a, what's known as an extract transform load tool. And you can use it to chain together a whole bunch of queries together. So essentially with this, we are able to pull out every evaluation from every course we have ever run and group it together. We plan to do, use this to do things like, for example, uh, giving a learner feedback on their confidence levels. So let's say in 2009, they took a course with us and they rated their confidence levels as such and such and such. In 2010, they took another course and they had site improvement. And now they're taking another course and we could potentially pull up that information that they gave us before and show them, these are your gaps. This is where you need to focus your learning. That's something that I'd like to do in the future, but it's gonna be quite challenging, and again, there's gonna be an issue of privacy. If a learner gave us their confidence levels when they had to take a course from their employer three years ago, are we still allowed to keep that information, and do they even want to know that information still? And we do get returning learners that come back after four years, uh, they've forgotten their password, but they still have history with us, so we try and pull up their account, make sure that they have all of their information preserved. All right, and that's about it. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Yep. Oh, one. I was wondering about your asynchronous um, communication versus getting a moment to spend time talking to each other. Do they? Well, we force them to if they want to pass the course. <laughs>
it's part of, uh, depending, some courses are self-directed where they can essentially get away without talking to anyone else. Those tend to be the introductory courses. Other ones are in a weekly format, um, like the patient navigation course, which is all about talking with patients. Each week there is a forum discussion that they have to participate in meaningfully, and if they don't participate in it, they don't pass the course. Yes? Um, what is an estimate of average time for production of an activity like you It's hard to estimate as it really depends on the complexity of the activity. Um, what we try and budget is roughly for a half hour module. It's about three to four weeks of production time in, some, in terms of instructional designer and a multimedia developer. Um, like w that plant alkaloids activity that I showed off, that was probably maybe two weeks of work from a multimedia developer. They're not working on it 100% of the time because there is a lot of back and forth. They'll come up with a, a drawing of a prototype that they'll run by the educator. Then they'll go back, come up with a working prototype, again, go back, make sure it's still as expected. And then there's a QA pass as with, with some of these things, you can get into situations where you can't back out or they've made a button that shows up underneath something else. So there's a QA component to this. It is, it is a big time investment. It is something that you want to make sure you get at least a few hundred to a few thousand learners through to really justify the investment. Yes? Do you use um, any voiceover audio? Um, so traditional e-learning does use voiceover audio in almost everything. Our challenge is that a lot of our learners are using health um, health organization or hospital computers to learn. They don't have audio or they don't have the the, the ability to turn on the audio because they are in a busy unit with potentially a lot of noise in the background. So we don't use any audio voiceovers. The other challenge with using voiceovers in our applications is because we have to keep refining things every year or possibly more often, we would have to keep re-recording audio, which is a great pain. One more, yeah. How do you keep track of your information kind of throughout the life cycle to know when you need to go back to um, so part of it is from feedback from the evaluations. If a link breaks, we get feedback in the comments. Uh, the teachers definitely hear about it and they let us know. Um, in terms of content, the educators attend, they're sent to the conferences. We have a partnership with Cancer Care Ontario who is actually issuing the healthcare administration guidelines. So they very well let us know when something is coming down the pike as they often expect us to create a course for it to translate their recommended guidelines into something that can be actually be taught. As typically these guidelines come out, they're like 20 pages of a dense PDF of um, information that's not easily digested. Thank you. Right. Thank you everyone.